Well, hello and welcome again to another edition of The Deal Flow Show. I'm J.P. Maroney, your host, along with my co-host for this episode, Mr. Paul Nicolini. Um, we have a great guest, as many. Uh, we have great guests here today for this episode, and it's Darren Marble. He's with both Issuance as well as the founder and CEO of Crush Capital. And uh, we're going to be talking about some pretty exciting things. And Darren, I was watching you on LinkedIn. I'd seen some of the posts you'd made, and they were topics that really resonated with me personally, especially related to capital raising and digital platforms that are being used nowadays for capital raising, as well as um, the, the deal-making process. So I know you've been involved yourself with some acquisition um, activity recently within the last couple of years in your own business. So we're gonna get into that whole dynamic and let's keep in mind that we're gonna talk about your business, your background, but we're also creating content that's gonna become a book called Deal Makers, Deal Breakers, where you're gonna, a lot of your tips and strategies and ideas about the deal flow process, going to the negotiating table, that whole M&A process, raising capital, um, how important that is, and we're going to share a lot of that knowledge, and it's going to be available in perpetuity to our audience and to our readers worldwide. So let's jump into this episode. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in this business in the capital markets. Well, thanks, guys, for having me on. It's a real pleasure. Um, like any good entrepreneur, we failed into it. Uh, I started a company about 10 years ago. We cut our teeth marketing rewards-based crowdfunding campaigns, um, of all things. We marketed about 100 campaigns on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And five years into that business, we were introduced to our first Regulation A-plus issuer. We signed that company, and we launched that company's campaign. It was for an automotive startup out of Arizona called Elio Motors. On June 19th, 2015, which was actually the day the Regulation A-plus securities exemption went into effect in the U.S., and that campaign was successful from a capital raising standpoint, raised about $17 million from 6,300 everyday Americans, and uh, was a, a real good pivot for my company. We went full swing into the Regulation A-plus industry, uh, into more traditional uh, capital markets, so to speak, and haven't looked back since. Very cool. So you've been on that real bleeding edge, I guess, of the whole Regulation A um, industry. How do you, because this has been obviously of interest with us at Harbor City, we've done Reg D offerings for our bonds previously and currently are moving into the broker-dealer space with Reg D offerings, but we've kind of slated the idea of a Reg A for the first quarter of next year as something potential in our securities council firm is very big. They do tons and tons of reg A's now. But how do you see the impact of our environment that we're in right now with, with COVID-19 and all this, you know, sequestering people or whatever, um, affecting the capital raising markets and especially impacting reg A in a positive or negative way? Uh, has definitely impacted the Reg A plus industry uh, in a very positive way. Reg A plus, if you think about it at its core, it's really an alternative financing vehicle. And right now, alternative financing is white hot. Companies are struggling to raise capital from uh, traditional sources. And in fact, there's more companies struggling for the same capital pools, uh, traditional VC, et cetera. In fact, we've seen more growth in the Reg A plus industry and in, in, in our businesses in the past nine months than we've ever seen in the past five years. So I think the industry as a whole is really taking off. More and more companies are looking for creative ways to finance their businesses. And of course, the beauty of Reg A is that it can be done entirely online. So the fact that it's a uh, digitally native capital raising mechanism makes it advantageous for companies in this environment where traditional VC is based on face-to-face -face meetings and going to someone's office and then doing that all over again. Uh, Reg A can be done entirely online on the issuer's own domain or on a platform. And uh, you know, part of the beauty of that, of course, is that everyday Americans, retail investors can participate in these offerings. You know, and on the one hand, you'd think that uh, you know, maybe there's an issue here because, you know, Reg A is raising from retail investors 
well, how are the retail investors doing? Are they still there? People are unemployed in the millions. It's a, kind of a crazy time. And the reality is they are there. Um, and, you know, the, the average investment in one of these offerings is about $2,500. And, you know, you think about that, there's a lot of people that can and do invest $2,500 into these uh, Reg A offerings. So it's just been um, a really great year. And I think we're fortunate and the service providers in this industry are fortunate. And we're doing everything we can to help uh, high quality companies raise capital in these markets because, of course, it's a very challenging times for for a lot of companies and of course people as well. How do you um, when you when you talk about raising completely online and whether it's on the issuer's website or a platform such as yours, what percentage of let's say subscriptions or however it's stated in a reg A, but the purchases of the the security is made without talking to someone, meaning the investor does it completely sort of non-contact with a human being? It's a great question. Um, I would estimate about 80% of retail investors are buying Reg A securities on an investment platform without speaking to a person. And I think there's several reasons for that. One, because when you run these campaigns on, on a website, you're actually able to provide a lot of valuable information um, in a relatively clean, easy to understand format. Um, the, you know, a two minute sizzle video, a link to the offering circular, how much capital is the company raising? What are the terms? What is, what is the deal structure? And so there's plenty of room for deal information to be communicated effectively to the average investor on the site. Um, and then the other reason is because again, the average investment here is about $2,500, not $25,000, nor is it a quarter of a million dollars. Therefore the decision-making process um, is streamlined. It's easier to convert an individual investor and get them excited about putting in $2,500 into a deal without talking to a person than a more traditional angel investor who's going to mull it over um, and, and maybe do you know more traditional due diligence. Now, that said, there are firms we work with in the Regulation A plus space hybrid financial um, out of Canada is one of them. They run call centers so that we you know have a click to call function on these campaigns if you hit one of these investment sites that we're managing um, and you'd like to speak to a person, you have that option. So some companies do implement that ability uh, in their investment campaigns. We think it's quite effective, but I wouldn't say it's a prerequisite or a requirement for success. And that's kind of the point of, of these campaigns in this industry. It's designed to be faster, easier, cheaper for companies to raise capital and ultimately easier for the retail investor as well. And so it's a win-win when an issuer is able to clearly communicate their investment uh, value proposition to the retail community at large. And retail investors uh, feel confident uh, in consuming that information to the point they're able to buy securities in a matter of minutes without speaking to another person. And I think you'll, con you'll continue to see that trend continue in the years ahead. You know, because of its digital nature, are you finding the demographics of the investor is, is lower now? The average age of the investor is lower? It's an, another good question. I think the answer is it depends on the retail distribution strategy for the particular offering. Um, so uh, on the one hand, one of the hot trends right now in the Regulation A plus industry is um, an increase in the number of independent financial publishers that are providing coverage and awareness for uh, a multitude of Regulation A plus campaigns. And the publishers uh, happen to have audiences that skew a bit older. The average age of their subscribers might be 60 years old, uh, male that has disposable income. So it depends on how the issuer is uh, creating awareness for the deal. If there's a financial publisher involved, uh, the people who are buying those information products from the publishers and paying them a fee to access that information they tend to skew a little bit older. Uh, on the other hand, I think, you know, the, the average age of a reggae retail investor, somewhere between, you know, maybe 30 and 40. Um, so it's really not the Robin Hood uh, demographic. It's not a, a young Gen Z investor who's buying a security for their first time. On average, uh, reggae investors tend to be um, a little bit older, a little bit more experienced, and potentially savvy or even very savvy. 
and I think that's one of the reasons that this is working so well um, is issuers are having success targeting likely investors. And more often than not, likely investors in a Reg A deal are not buying a security for their first time, but they've, they've got some, some kind of investing experience under their belt. How are they, you mentioned the public, the financial publications, and you're say, is that on a, um, like an advertising type situation? They're, they're paying a fee to be exposed to that audience, or as you said, on the opposite side, you've got a paid subscription base, and as part of their service, the publisher is providing this information or access to their readers? Uh, the latter, and, and that's part of what's so great about this model and, and what's working really well in the industry the publishers that are providing coverage of these reggae investment opportunities are totally independent. They do not charge compensation to the issuer. They don't take cash fees. They don't take stock fees. Um, they don't put a contract in place with the issuer. Therefore, they're independent and unbiased. And when they go out with coverage of a deal, they're able to tell their subscribers that they've scoured the market and they've identified ABC company as a promising or interesting alternative investment opportunity. And therefore, um, that, that you know, promotion carries a lot of weight with their subscribers. And there's no disclosure, there's no 17B disclaimer required uh, because they have not received compensation. So that model is working really well right now. And you know, what we're, we're doing with this series is probably worth mentioning where we think the industry is actually headed in kind of the final uh, and maybe the biggest way to distribute these deals is through a television series. And, and that's what we're launching. You know, we're launching a series called Going Public, where we follow the stories of founders as they're raising capital, taking their companies public to NASDAQ. And for the first time ever, the viewers of the show can actually invest into the IPOs at the IPO price. And we thought, you know, what better way to get um, a retail investor or a customer of a brand excited than to really, you know, provide an in-depth profile and follow the journey of these companies, not just on a landing page or in a two-minute sizzle video, but put them in a, in a story, put them in a show where the viewers can follow the founders week after week. And as crazy as that sounds, I actually believe it will be the largest distribution ever brought to the industry uh, when we launch this thing in April next year. Uh, we signed a distribution deal with Entrepreneur Media. They run the website entrepreneur.com. We're forecasting about 2 million unique viewers per episode. And at one point, you know, you, I would have thought this was crazy. You know, I would have diverted or reverted back to like, let's do a paid media campaign or let's get some PR for the company. But we think this is actually a very um, natural way to expose retail investors to a deal and to allow them to invest from their desktop, phone or tablet device. Are there any regulatory landmines with this with this idea? You know, you, you would think there are, uh, but it turns out there's not, that there is a proper way to do this series. So, you know, you look at Reg A+, plus, well, what is it? It's a securities exemption. Uh, it allows a company to raise $50 million. It allows the company to generally solicit or market their investment. And anyone over the age of 18 globally can legally invest. So we've been able to drive hundreds of millions of dollars into companies using this uh, securities exemption through paid media campaigns, Facebook campaigns, Google campaigns, through PR campaigns, um, getting a company featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, getting an interview on Kramer's Mad Money, a podcast like yours, uh, or owned media campaigns. The company can now market their investment to their million uh, paid customers. So a TV series is actually a natural and obvious extension to what's already been happening in this industry for the past five years. Now, are there nuances and, and kind of some details uh, in, in, you know, in the production? Yes, there are. So quick example, we have to make sure that anything that makes it to air. So uh, you know, if you're one of the companies and we're producing the series and we put you in the show and it airs, week after week in uh, April next year, the statements you make have to match up with the um, statements that are filed in your Form 1A offering circular with the SEC. So there's a, a, a more rigorous production review and editing process that is going to be infused into this series than there is in probably most other shows. The statements have to match up. Um, and then there's some other nuances. 
for instance, the reason we chose to have this series streamed online instead of featured on a broadcast television network is because once a company receives SEC qualification, technically they're only able to communicate the investment uh, through electronic means with a clickable hyperlink. And I know that might sound crazy too, but it's, it's in law. So that means you actually can't have a version of this show that's on, uh, let's say, CNBC, where you know the company's on every week or it's a standalone format and people uh, go online to invest. Th there's format issues there. So because we've been in the space for a number of years, we're very familiar with the nuances of the securities rules, uh, uh, compliance rules, regulations. And so we designed this series to be uh, not only compliant, um, but actually what we think we're doing is we think we're fulfilling the promise of the Jobs Act, the promise of the Reg A plus exemption. This is what these laws were designed to do. They're designed to, you know, provide easier access to capital for emerging businesses on one hand, and on the other hand, to level the playing field for everyday Americans, to give everyday Americans an opportunity to become owners in businesses whose products and services they use in their everyday lives. What better way to do that uh, and democratize access to investments and put these deals in a show that's broadcast to millions of people or streamed online in this case, you know, week after week for 10 weeks. So there's my, uh, my, my long-winded answer, but the answer is yes, it's uh, completely doable. What is the mix that you're seeing of debt versus equity in the re reggae offerings? I think most reggae offerings are, are equity offerings. Um, you know, there is an exemption called Reg CF, which stands for Regulation Crowdfunding. That's another securities exemption. Went into effect in 2016. Companies can raise up to just over a million dollars. Those are for really super early stage companies, um, what we consider to be the highest risk deals in the industry. And of course, they're generally illiquid investments, which is another concern. In those deals, you might more commonly see um, debt investments, uh, convertible debt, safes, et cetera. Uh, in the Reg A deals, most of these companies um, have raised an angel, a Series A financing. They might be doing 10, $50 million in sales at that point, the majority of those deals um, are, are, are equity deals. Entering the capital markets, as you know, is no cheap um, process, yeah. right? And if you go to the, the traditional route, like a broker-dealer community, it can be substantial with all the layers of uh, service providers, compliance, third-party due diligence providers, all of that sort of thing. What is the typical cost for a Reg A plus um, offering as you're seeing it? Maybe you can give me an elastic band of the, the low and high. It's gonna range from eight to 12% cost of capital, maybe an average of 10%. And maybe 10% of that 10% is paid up front to a handful of service providers to initiate or launch the campaign. So, you know, I think the average reggae issuer we're working with right now is raising about 10 million, uh, average cost of about a million dollars with maybe a hundred, maybe $150,000 paid up front to a handful of service providers and uh, another 850000 or $900,000 of expense on the back end of the deal as the company is funding. So, you know, the, the truth is that Regulation A plus is not technically a cheap way to raise capital. Um, it's also not necessarily an easy way to raise capital. There are a number of service providers that are required to work together uh, in unison uh, to help these companies be successful. However, I believe it's the greatest securities exemption available in the United States today and potentially for years to come because companies can market their deals. They can turn their customers into investors. When you turn a customer into an investor, you're actually creating the most powerful brand ambassador you could ever dream of. Someone who's a, a you know, literal uh, uh, investor in the company, they're financially invested, emotionally invested. That's the ideal relationship a uh, company should desire with their, their customers, not just to be a customer and own a product or you know, pay a subscription uh, for a service, but to become an owner in the business and um, the lifetime value of those customers increase, et cetera. So uh, I would say eight to 12%, uh, the more capital you raise, the lower the cost of capital. So on a $20 million financing, the cost of capital could be seven or 8%. Uh, 
And certainly uh, on the lower end, if you raise just $5 million, cost of capital could be 15% or more. Uh, but the average company we're working with is raising $10 million with about a 10% cost of capital. Does crush capital or issuance, is there any other function in this process that you all provide? Well, Crush Capital is the creator and owner of the Going Public series. We're actively casting for season one. We're looking for five great companies to put into this show. Uh, we're two weeks out from announcing our host. We're yeah, four weeks out from announcing the first issuer. I'm sorry, I, I had to interrupt. I said, we have one for you. If you're looking for a great company, we do have one for you. A hundred percent. Listen, send it across right now. Companies can apply on goingpublic.com. Um, and then issuance is... is um, you know, it's my legacy financial marketing firm. We, we take deals, um, you know, deal to deal basis. And um, we, we've been doing it for years. I think the common denominator between these two businesses is they are both centered around the Reg A plus securities exemption. And, uh, you know, Crush Capital has a, a vision to put these deals into a television series. So it's just a different format. It's a different marketing and retail distribution strategy. You know, and, and ultimately, guys, what, what really drives us is the belief that everyday Americans do deserve an opportunity to invest into earlier stage private companies. At a minimum, they deserve the opportunity. Whether somebody wants to invest into a deal or not, of course, they're going to make that decision. Uh, it's their discretion. But we think it's, um, you know, just unfortunate that for so long, Retail investors, I mean, if you look at the IPO markets today, these big companies like Uber and Lyft, they go public 10 years after staying private. They've raised billions of dollars in private markets. Um, and all the value is wrung out by the early investors. And you know who doesn't get a piece of that action? The millions of customers who contributed to that valuation. They're left to buy the shares uh, in the public markets 10 years later. And we think that that's criminal. We think that that needs to change and it needs to change now. And that when given the opportunity, uh, customers will often take advantage of that and become owners in businesses whose products they use, uh, whose founders they believe in, whose founders uh, worldview aligns with their worldview. That's where we believe uh, the markets are headed. In fact, we think it is a mega trend. It will be a mega trend in capital markets for companies to allow customers to become owners. And so that's what drives us and that's a common denominator between crush capital and issuance. What is the um, acceptance that you're seeing in the more traditional channels like the broker dealer or advisor community for Reg A's? Well, I, I think, you know, broker dealers, they can't deny that this is a viable pathway um, for capital raising and you know, look, here's, here's a great example. At Crush Capital, we've partnered with an investment bank in this series. In fact, we partnered with Ross Capital in Southern California. They've agreed to firm commitment underwrite the Reg A plus IPOs that we put into the show. That's actually an industry first. It's never happened. If we look back five years, all the past Reg A plus IPOs were all underwritten on a best efforts basis. So, here we have a credible small cap underwriter willing to step up to the plate and pioneer the industry with us. And we think that solves a lot of the problems and issues that were prevalent in the past Reg A plus deals. So I think I can start there and say, hey, look, here's a great example. We now have uh, credible investment banks coming into the industry for the first time ever, uh, and they're going to firm commitment underwrite these deals. And that's something that hasn't happened in five years. That's a good indicator of what's happening in this industry right now and what the future for the industry holds. So we believe that in the years ahead, more investment banks, bulge bracket firms, larger investment banks are also going to begin participating in the space. And of course, the SEC has recommended that the cap on Reg A go from 50 to 75 million. We believe that that will take effect sometime in early 2021. And when it does, it will just draw more high caliber companies into the industry and of course, higher caliber service providers, including broker dealers, investment banks and underwriters who now see an opportunity to generate larger fees. So all of these things I think are uh, good indicators that there's a lot of growth to be had in this space in the months and years ahead. 
With what you mentioned earlier with entrepreneur media, you kept using the word, we have a deal, we did a deal, and then you just talked about Ross Capital, um, basically what you stated, an unprecedented deal where they're going to blanket take your, your deals, which I know there's a lot of things going into that. But you're a consummate deal maker. That's what I, I my sense is, is, you know, uh, you go back to your, uh, as you said, rewards-based crowdfunding that was pre-Reg A side of things. My question for you is, when you're, because this this content, again, is now, we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit, is more about the deal-making process. When you're putting together these kinds of deals, whether it's entrepreneur media and your show, whether it's Ross and the acceptance of and underwriting of these deals, what is your process for preparing for battle or engagement, going out, seeking out partners, seeking out um, deals that make sense to help you achieve your objectives? Can you walk us through the mindset of the deal making process? Yeah, look, I mean, we can use entrepreneur as an example. What we, we realized needed to happen to make this series come to life is we needed a deal with either a television network or a, a big digital publisher um, that aligned with our, our mission. And so that was the first thing is, you know, what makes a good deal? Well, if you have an alignment of values, uh, if we share the same vision of the world, then that's an incredibly valuable starting point because with that alignment, everything else can fall into place rather easily. And the, the beauty of that is you often go into conversation with a potential partner and you can flush that out very quickly. So for example, you know, my business partner and I at Crush Capital, and I'll never forget this, we went into a talent agency that was representing LinkedIn. And at some point, this was like three years ago, Somehow we thought LinkedIn could be a good platform for this series. And so LinkedIn referred us to their talent a agency in LA. We get into a room with this guy and it's like, you know, pearly white halls of some big Hollywood agency. We tell him about the reggae plus exemption and it's a game changer and everyday Americans can invest into um, what could be promising investment opportunities. And this guy says, that sounds crazy. He said, I don't think the average person should have the, the right to invest in these deals. They could lose all their money. They're not informed. They're not sophisticated. And we knew right away, this is not, this is not our guy. This guy does not share the, the worldview that we have. In fact, he's an antagonist. Let's get the heck out of here. You know? And so we, we got out of there. And uh, the, the folks at Entrepreneur had precisely the opposite perspective. They believe that uh, the future of investing involves retail investors and that customers deserve an opportunity to become owners. So alignment of values is something we look for right away. And uh, you either have it or you don't. You usually can't convince somebody to have your, your values. But if you share the same values, that's a good starting point. Um, you know, and again, everything else from there is almost a detail. Um, I think other things that are important for us are the people who we're going to be working with. Uh, you know, I I'm in my early forties now, I just turned 40 last year and I'm at the point in my, my life and career. I don't want to, I don't want to work with people who, who are punks or who are going to be challenging to work with, or we don't get along. Life is too short. We want to work with people who we're going to have a fun time working with. So if we have alignment of values, who are the people on the other end of the deal? Can we see ourselves working with these people not just on a project, but, you know, for years to come, can we be successful working with them uh, for a long time? So we have to like the people we're working with. And um, it's actually important. I mean, it's, I think we've all been in situations where we end up getting into a project. Um, it could be, you know, anything where, where the, the people on the other end of the deal are antagonistic or they're challenging to work with. And that just creates headaches and stress and drama. I don't want to deal with that. I want to work with people who are easygoing, who are cool, who are fun, have a sense of humor. Uh, and so once we have alignment, we're looking for likability. You know, and then there's the details of the deal. Do the economics work? Is the value exchange fair? Are we getting uh, what we want in the deal? Is the partner getting what they want? I would say those are the top three things is alignment of values, 
are the people we're working with good people? Are we going to have a fun time working with them? And then do the economics of the deal match for each each uh, party? Interesting. Yeah, that is. Um, Darren, what do you do in the case of failure? How do you deal with that? How do you manage that? And how do you move forward? You know, I've been an entrepreneur now for 10 years. And I think, you know, you, you learn to handle failure. Um, at least for me, my, my ability to handle failure has evolved tremendously. In the early days, you know, failure hurt. Um, it was painful. It stung. It was uh, demotivating. You could even, you get emotional about it. And I've been through it so much now that it, it almost doesn't phase me. I know that if I'm not failing uh, in some ways, I'm probably not pushing the boundaries hard enough. You have to fail to succeed uh, as a business owner or entrepreneur, or as a deal maker. There's nobody that has a hundred percent track record of success. Um, it just doesn't exist. And so Failure is part of the game in business and in deal making. And I think what smart entrepreneurs and deal makers do is they do a postmortem. So for deals that don't work, you know, let's look back. Let's not just, you know, have a quick call and then move on to the next. Let's take a moment, pause and reflect. Why didn't that deal work? What, you know, what did we go in? Uh, what were the expectations going in? And, and you know, where, where did we miss the mark? And what can we do in the future to avoid that outcome? So savvy deal makers learn from their mistakes. They, they try not to make the same mistake twice or three times, because if you do, you're just not learning. And so the failure becomes a part of your methodology. It becomes a part of your DNA uh, as, as a deal maker. And you try to uh, repeat the behaviors that result in successful outcomes for you and your partners or clients. And you avoid the behaviors um, you know, that, that result in failures. And at the end of the day, you just get back up, get on the horse and do it again. And you got to have an optimistic attitude. Uh, and you know, that can take you far. I love it. And the mindset part of it, here's a good question for you. And I'm going to ask it when we come back. But if you're listening or watching this episode of The Deal Flow Show, you can get access to previous episodes as well as subscribe and follow us for future episodes at thedealflowshow.com. On behalf of myself, Paul Nicolini, my co-host for this episode. All right, back to Darren Mar Marble. So here's my question. You were a, um, a, a high jumper, correct? Or involved in track and field, right? That's right. right. Yeah, so man, I, I can't believe you guys figured that out. Uh, one of our, our guys that you've talked to here is on our business development team, Daniel Penaranda. So he's the producer for the Deal Flow Show as well. You've communicated with him in email. Daniel was a competitive long distance runner in high school and college, went to college on scholarship for that. And he and I were talking the other day about mindset, and he was talking about visualization and how. He used to literally visualize, run the race, um, even, I think, and I'm going to get it right, the kick. Is that right, Daniel? He, he even visualized the kick at the end, um, how he you know, put it into gear and, and went and he saw it in his mind. We've heard Tony Robbins, obviously one of the more uh, vocal people about this, but many successful people talk about mindset. Anything from the track and field days that were habits or characteristics or patterns or anything that have carried over and served you in business or in the deal making process? Absolutely. And I love that anecdote. Um, you know, visualization is, is critical. I mean, if I think back, man, it was 1998. I was a the state champion high jumper in California. Um, and, you know, there, there's some natural talent. I was a tall, lanky guy, and, and that turned out to be a good structure for a high jumper, but I had a great coach. I had a great mentor. And I think that's something that was really critical to my success um, as a founder uh, in business years later, finding people that have experience, finding people you can talk to, seek advice from. And this goes to, you know, the value of creating an advisory board, a fiduciary board, surrounding yourself with industry experts, um, you'll never know it all, but, you know, having a great coach uh, in, in track and field and high jump back in the late 90s, I would have never had the success I did 
had I not had my coach, uh, Fred Graber. And, um, you know, now in business, I've also consciously sought out mentors, uh, people who are a little bit older that have more experience and know how and have uh, had more success uh, than I have. So, you know, having a coach is important, you know, and, and what I loved about sports is, you know, I, I've always been competitive and, um, you know, I, I don't think you have to be an athlete to be a successful entrepreneur, but for me, that um, desire to compete and win has always stayed with me. Um, you know, winning feels great and celebrating the win feels great. And, you know, it, to win requires a lot of patience and dedication and failure along the way. And uh, I've always wanted to, to win in sports and in business. And, uh, you know, this is just, I'm thinking of this out loud, but one of the things I always loved about high jump, it's one of those very strange sports where you always go out on a loss. You know, a race is a race. You have, you know, 40 seconds or 50 seconds and somewhere in between every time. High jump, you have three attempts at each height. You clear the bar at 6'8", it goes up 6'10". You clear the bar at 6'10", it goes to 7 feet. And you always finish that event on three misses. You're forced to lose. Um, and it's just, it was an incredibly humbling experience. And I think it taught me a lot um, about resilience and getting back up. But um, I wanted to share that with you. It's just uh, people, you know, they get they, these sports confused, high jump, pole vault, high jump, you're jumping over the bar, pole jump, you're, uh, you're jumping, you know, you got the pole. But um, I, I think I, I took a lot away from that experience. But having a great coach, a great mentor showing up, I think are big factors in success down the road. I love that. And the idea of a loss is actually the goal, right? You, your goal is to keep pushing the bar higher until you cannot achieve it and you go out on the loss. I never actually drew that comparison. That's, that's very interesting. So you asked a question about failure earlier. So I want to come back to that real quick. And you mentioned having coaches and mentors. Back years ago, 1995, Tyler, Texas, my wife and I had been building businesses for a few years. I was 25 years old. I'd been building companies for, attempting to build companies for six years. I went bankrupt, lost everything, found myself sitting in a little room just outside where they were about to hold our bankruptcy hearing. And it felt like sitting, like a minnow sitting in a shark tank because they had us in the waiting area with our creditors. Like those people were across the, the, the uh, room sitting in the chairs looking back at me. And I sat there at that moment in one of my greatest failures that I, you mentioned that you said it feels like a stopper, right? Like a, the, it's the end of time when you're younger. And, and I sat there in that moment and I made myself two promises. The first promise I made to myself was that I was going to never, ever give up on my dream. My granddad used to have a sign that hung in his study that said winners never quit and quitters never win. And that's cliche to us now, but I thought back to that sign and I remembered that sign. The second promise I made to myself ties into what you said about getting the right people as mentors. I said, I'm going to seek and search until I find the people who have done what it is that I want to do, and then I'm going to learn from them. One of my greatest quotes I got from one of my mentors years ago, he said, if you want to be a master at anything, study what the masters have done before you, learn to do what they have done, and then have the courage or the guts to do it, and you can be a master just like them. There's already a pattern. And if you look at building a business, launching a product, to, you know, a capital raising process like this, the model has already been built. You just have to be willing to find the people, surround yourself with the people. I'm super excited that we've had you on this show to be able to share some of that knowledge. Um, before we go, um, and again, you're listening or watching The Deal Flow Show, and if you'd like to get access to more episodes, go to thedealflowshow.com. We've got Darren Marble on with us. Again, my co-host, Paul Nicolini. One more quick question. What kind of people would you like to hear from? There's going to be people that watch this, hear this, and they're going to think, hmm, maybe I should reach out to this guy. What kind of people would you like to hear from, and how should they best get in touch with you? Uh, two kinds. We're looking for companies that are interested in raising capital and building their brand, companies that might have a consumer product, a retail business, direct-to-consumer, 
They can apply to be featured in the inaugural season of Going Public on goingpublic.com. I'm also um, an open networker on LinkedIn. That's where I have uh, my, my, my social presence and profile. And uh, we're hiring. We're actually hiring at both uh, Crush Capital for the Going Public series and at Issuance, uh, my financial marketing firm. We're looking for um, account managers, project managers, so companies can go to, uh, you know, contact me on LinkedIn if if, if you think uh, you want to learn more about what we what we're doing and uh, how we might be able to work together. And thank you for asking. Well, we've already heard about your um, your your high school athletic um, career, but what else can the business community know about Darren Marble that they don't already know? Uh, I'm seven years sober. I have not drank alcohol for seven years, and I credit my sobriety uh, in large part to my entrepreneurial success. Um, and I wrote about it in an article in Business Insider a few years ago. You know, running a business is, uh, the odds are against you. Nine out of 10 times you're going to fail. So if the odds are that rough, what can you do to increase your odds of not failing? And for me, making the decision to stop drinking turned out to be the best uh, personal and business decision I ever made. And for the record, I was not ever thinking that that was going to be a good decision for me. I didn't think I had a huge problem. I was a big red wine drinker, but um, I've been sober for seven years. And what it's allowed me to do as an entrepreneur is to channel all of my energy and my focus and my intelligence and skill into business building and to deal making. And um, it's been an incredible um, transformation for me. So if anybody out there is listening, something's not working in your personal life, something's not working in your business, you're not closing the deals you want, I challenge you to stop drinking for just 30 days um, and then maybe 90 days and see if it makes a difference because it did for me. That's outstanding, congratulations. Excellent. Well, on my on behalf of my co-host, Paul Nicolini, I'm J.P. Maroney. Thanks, Darren Marble, again for joining us from Issuance and Crush Capital and for not only sharing about your company, because we all want to go out there and, and uh, get a chance to promote and talk, but from digging deep into your storehouse of knowledge and sharing back with our audience. I know you'll be getting in, uh, have people getting in touch with you as a result of hearing your story, hearing what y'all bring to the market, and also hearing about these exciting new deals and projects that y'all have going on. Once again, this is The Deal Flow Show, and if you'd like to get access to more episodes or subscribe for future, go to thedealflowshow.com. We'll see you in another episode very, very soon. Take care. Thanks, Darren. For more episodes, visit thedealflowshow.com and subscribe.